Hi, and good afternoon. Um, happy Saturday. My name is Jonah Bocaire, and I want to extend absolutely the warmest welcome to you today. This is the kickoff of a local humanities series uh, within the Hudson Eye Annual Festival. Um, the Hudson Eye Annual Festival is an annual 10-day event that um, takes place in historic downtown Hudson, New York, the 10 days before Labor Day every year. Our mission is really local artists and local venues, as well as bolstering tourism in town safely and enhancing diversity. Uh, my name is Jonah Bocaire, and I'm the founder of, it, of the Hudson Eye. Um, this is really not about me. This is really about how we can all grow Hudson with one another. During this extraordinary 2020, um, we are holding the Hot Topics Humanities series all online via Zoom webinar. So we want to extend the warmest welcome. Um, I'm also here to thank the funders who are making this possible. Um, we have an anonymous $50,000 local match, which stimulates grassroots giving in town. Um, you may have the opportunity to give one, five, and anything. And that really is about growing um, the local arts-based economy. Um, we also want to thank the Jam Kaplan Fund. Um, as well as many, many others, the Trust for Mutual Understanding and the Hudson Board of Tourism, as well as the Common Council. We're live from Hudson Hall. Our remarks will be brief. And today to kick off the series is future Hudson, Peter Spear and many of his colleagues. Um, Aaron Levi Garvey is the curator of the Hudson Eye um, and we want you to have a great time with this new format. Thank you and stay safe. Having some te technical difficulties on my side. Um, so you won't be able to see me, but I think you can, everyone can hear me. Um, as John mentioned, this is our first of the series of the Hot Topics Humanities panel. Uh, we're located within the West Room of Hudson Hall. Uh, typically, in a normal world, uh, we would all be here gathered together. Um, to have this panel series and, and discuss these uh, global topics on a local level. Uh, today's panel is the future of Hudson and Design for Six Feet. Um, this panel will discuss the work of Design for Six Feet, an initiative started by Anna Deitch Kaya Kuhl and Liz McKenney uh, as a crowdsourced catalog of tactical urbanism and public space interventions since the beginning of the global pandemic this past March. This group will also discuss its collaboration with Future Hudson, Hudson Hall, and the city of Hudson <clears throat> as they embarked on the creation of a shared experience on Warren Street in Hudson, as well as a recent design competition for outdoor play in response to closed libraries, canceled summer camps, and the uncertainty of school reopenings. Um, I would like to introduce Peter Spear, who is the moderator. Hello, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you, everybody at the Hudson Eye for including us in this um, really sort of beautiful series of events that you guys have been doing. Um, and I'm excited to be here in conversation with um, Design for Six Feet. If I can invite Kaya, Anna, and Liz to sort of join me here. Um, so my name is Peter Spear, and um, uh, I, I, sort of, I guess I operate under the name Future Hudson, which was sort of a loosely organized bunch of planners and designers in Hudson advocating for you know, real urban design in Hudson. Um, and I'm excited to talk to Design for Six Feet today about sort of urban design in Hudson and the Hudson Valley and the pandemic. Um, and uh, I guess maybe to begin, Kaya, we initially, we were gonna do this on the street. Um, it seemed like a, a no brainer for you to do this in the street in front of Hudson Hall, but weather sort of prohibited us. I wondered why would you, why, why was it important to you to do this in the street? Uh, well, you know, the, the street and what's happening in outdoor spaces um, to, as a space to um, so socially connect, physically distance, 
is sort of been the topic of our both research and collection, as well as, you know, the focus of our project together, Hudson Shared Streets. And so it kind of just seemed uh, very obvious to me to like demonstrate that we can still have events like this um, if we keep some sort of measures uh, in mind. And so we tested out last week how we could do that. Um, the weather unfortunately didn't allow us to be outside of Hudson Hall and use the street as um, an event space. Nice. Yeah, so um, I would love to hear you guys talk a little bit about how Design for Six Feet came to be. Uh, Liz, would you like to? Um, sure, and maybe we start by um, sharing the screen to show our Instagram account. So Kaya, Anna, and I have taught uh, in the urban design program at Columbia GSAP for several years. So when the global pandemic um, really kicked off, we started to have weekly conversations about what was happening and what we thought our role might be in it. And I think one of the things uh, in early March, at least, that came about was, let's just start a, a crowdsourced catalog. We'll use Instagram as the format, and we'll just see what's happening around the world. And I think that was, we personally had no idea what to expect of, of what types of images would be submitted or what we'd start to see online. But I think that's been an interesting way to just track our changing understanding of the pandemic and how we use um, shared public space. And I think if you look at some of the earliest images, you see that um, space is very clearly defined. It's, uh, there's a lot of tape. There are, um, you know, circles for distancing. It's very much, this is my space, that's your space six feet away. And I think as you scroll through the account, um, you see the shift from social distancing to the idea of physical distancing, that we are still socially connected um, while re retaining this distance. So you start to see these rigid squares and circles and lines give way to uh, open streets, dining in the streets, um, and now kind of thoughts about uh, the future, which includes how kids are gonna go to school, what's gonna happen at playgrounds, into the fall and beyond. So I think this account has just been kind of a good touch point of um, what we're seeing kind of happening globally um, and how we could potentially respond to things. Yeah. Um, I love hearing you describe and how you course, noticed... Think... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, of course, it's been um, the response, just seeing how municipalities have stepped in. But I think that it's there's been such a grassroots organization of individuals, um, you know, employing tactical urbanism that I think in turn shaped municipal and public policy. So a lot of the proposals are just individuals who decided to start taping up their side, sidewalk or stoop or really um, be the, the leaders of thinking about how to use their space. And I think that in some instances, municipalities have caught up to that. And then of course, we've just seen our changing understanding of the pandemic itself and also just an understanding of how uh, the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on certain communities and we've certainly seen that yeah i'm wondering anna like how would you describe sort of the where we are now with relations to sort of public space and design and the pandemic sort of what's the big picture as you understand i always wonder like what is it like being an urban designer in the pandemic like what what does the world look like to you we are muted you would need to unmute please Sorry for that. Um, yeah, like Liz said, you know, when that this whole thing started and we were each um, in our Zoom screens trying to sort out what was going on. But very quickly, we realized this was um, an opportunity, right? Because suddenly everyone, like Liz mentioned, not only the silos of urban design and the planning was discussing, um, you know, things that pertain to our um, profession and, and what we think about. So it was very interesting. And then the Instagram account was interesting because it showed that response, you know, how quickly people caught up to it. Um, and we saw, you know, from two, three people involved, like, you know, it grow very fast. 
uh, one, because yes, we were in the middle of the pandemic and everyone was interested. Um, but I think also, you know, the topic, you know, what do we do with the fine grain, right? Like how, 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 how am I going to solve very mundane problems and daily problems like going somewhere or, you know, the sidewalk, the street, the bicycle, the transportation. So, um, we, I think there is an opportunity here that we start rediscussing these things from, you know, bottom up, which is very interesting. Um, and I think, you know, like um, I think Kaya mentioned, we have to reopen schools, we have to reopen um, playgrounds, we have to socialize. So how are we going to do that? And, and maybe there is another way, um, which is a little bit different from what we were doing. Um, and, and even, you know, the shared streets, which, which is happening all over the world, right? Not only in Hudson, um, could point to some kind of, of a different balance between cars and pedestrians, for example. So I think in the long run, this could become a very interesting, um, you know, a positive discussion, right? Yeah. Um, Kaya, sort of same question. And you, I know you always were talking, uh, the, your, I don't know if it's a slogan, but you often talk about physically connected uh, or physically distant, socially connected. I'm just sort of curious. I'd love to hear you talk more sort of big picture and sort of the, the, the point of view that you have on, on uh, street space and public space. It, to me, this started with, you know, when the, the term social distancing um, was, be, you know, was being used everywhere. I was sort of, I mean, I realized that because it was used everywhere in the media, it was too late to stop that train in a way, but I always felt like this, that this is actually the, the, a really weird way to describe what's happening because in a way, you know, we were all sitting at home, you know, just connecting through our screens. And so we, you know, we've had a really hard time to stay socially connected to friends, um, family, colleagues, and so forth. Um, and that wasn't necessarily the goal. The goal was to stay physically six feet apart or however, whatever distance would be safe, um, but stay socially connected. And so, it, yes, maybe it is a little bit a slogan and I try to emphasize using the word physically distanced whenever I can, because that is really what keeps us safe in this pandemic. Um, but uh, socially, we don't want to be more disconnected from each other than this, this sort of weird situation already does to us that you know, right now we're, you know, none, the four of us are not in the same space. And so I found it very challenging to stay connected to people that I've, seen on screen only for the last six months. Yeah, do you want to, I'm curious, you guys designed for six feet. Obviously, I'm gonna, we can talk about shared streets um, in a little bit, but I, I wondered if you guys would talk a little bit about the work that you guys have been doing elsewhere. Uh, Liz? Um, sure, I can start with some of the work we've been doing in Newburgh. So um, I know we'll come back to Hudson and the shared streets, because Peter, you were great in bringing us here and having uh, our first project that wasn't just gathering images, but was actually us trying to get people back out onto the street and see what that means and what partnerships are necessary to see that happen. Um, so um, Kai, I don't know if you wanna share the screen for, um, for the Newberg Design for Play competition, but um, as part of the work that we've done at Columbia, we've been very active in the Hudson Valley and Kaya has spearheaded the Hudson Valley initiative for several years and we've all been involved in that um, for the past several years working in different communities. So um, we reached out to our colleagues in Newburgh and had a conversation with the Department of Planning there to find out what some of the challenges they were facing. And like Hudson, they were trying to think about how to encourage outdoor dining and what types of barriers would be needed for restaurants. Um, but at the point they were thinking about that, um, we were already working with, with you and Hudson, so we had some design guidelines that we could send to them. So the other thing that they were very interested in was the idea of getting kids out to be able to play and connect. And um, Newburgh had proposed some um, slow streets or play streets. And then they were also thinking further into the fall of how um, play was going to happen um, 
in the schoolyard. So the idea came about of how could we organize a design competition for ideas for play equipment um, that could let kids play, learn, socialize, um, come together in the streets, and uh, to also design equipment that could be moved elsewhere for the fall. So we ended up um, partnering with great organizations in Newburgh, which I think really made this whole thing possible. So uh, we partnered with Awesome Newburgh, the Fullerton Center, the City of Newburgh, um, the Newburgh Armory, the library is now involved. So I think because we were able to really rally um, a very wide representative representative grouping of Newburgh organizations, we ended up getting over 70 proposals um, and we're now going to uh, build three uh, hopefully within the next few weeks. So you're seeing some of the winners here of winning ideas of um, this one here is for kind of a, an art uh, piece where community members get to paint and add to a wall that grows and can be moved elsewhere. Um, Vassar students came up with a great idea for something called maker board where uh, there's a transparent piece of plexiglass and kids can play checkers with each other with one kid on either side of the plexiglass space and play music using this kind of divider. Um, and then an idea for an outdoor pavilion um, at the library that would allow for uh, puppetry and other things to happen outdoors. So um, it's really exciting to see, to, to not just be collecting these ideas, but to actually see them um, come into fruition and materialize. So we will definitely keep you posted on the status of of the construction of these projects in the next few weeks. That's beautiful. Those are amazing. Uh, you mentioned Newburgh having a department of planning and I, I sort of sort of wince in envy. I mean, I know that sort of Future Hudson, it was really my sort of effort to sort of agitate for planning in Hudson. And we, you know, the city doesn't have that capability. And sometimes I joke that the comprehensive plan was uh, developed um, the same year that Titanic was the movie of the year. Uh, that was a very long time ago. Um, and so uh, I guess I've just open question. Um, what do you guys think CD, like how do, how do cities respond? What is being asked of cities and municipalities now that wasn't, that wasn't before? I've heard a couple of you talk about partnerships and new relationships. Certainly we had that experience, but just sort of open question about what is, what is the pandemic asked of municipalities now? I can take that. Um, so I, I think two things come to mind, and you, met, you know, you mentioned the envy of Hudson, of you know, of a planning department. Or um, the thing that is still true, even though Newburgh, I think, has you know, a planning director and two staff members um, for small cities, is generally capacity. So the dependence on either outside consultants or partnerships um, is always great in small cities because there isn't necessarily the sort of capacity in government to do these things, especially in moments like this where you, know, you don't have a lot of time to plan and organize and get funding and hire a consultant or um, hire staff. It all kind of had to happen very quickly. Um, the, the, and that, that part, the have you know, having to sort of react very quickly, um, that has been true all over the world. And so that's what we've been seeing both through the sort of images that we collected um, on Instagram, but also just sort of reading news about how cities are changing across the world that um, this moment in time has forced a lot of government agencies to react incredibly fast. Um, New York City, which has now a, a restaurant program that is similar to Hudson Shared Streets, has, I think in the first two weeks, had to manage 5,000 applications for um, outdoor dining. And so, so there are sort of challenges right now that all city governments face in addition to you know, funding challenges that will you know, be, become more real uh, very soon. But it's really the, the sort of capacity is challenged of all governments, um, especially small ones that don't really have staff to do the, this kind of work. Yeah. Anna or Liz, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think that, um, I, I think not only in, in 
you know, in urban design or planning, but in all areas, the pandemic has exposed our cracks, right? Our weak points. Um, and I think one important thing is, you know, coming from Brazil, this has always been some kind of, you know, there's always this comparison in my mind, you know, how, how well can the public sector and the private sector dialogue, right? How, and, and the community. So I think this effectiveness and the speed that Kaya is mentioning also has to do with tools and um, places that are already in place or ha have to be put in place so that dialogue can happen, right? Which is really the democratic dialogue. You know, you mentioned before we went online the word, the civic dialogue, right? So how, how prepared are we um, as cities and, and countries um, to have that dialogue? It's, it's a very um, complex question in, in democracies, right? And one that I think now are, is even more questioned in, in so many places. Yeah, you, Liz, do you have, do you have anything, anything you'd like to add? No, I just like to chime in. I think that, you know, because we've had such relationships with Hudson and Newburgh, I think that those, speaking about those two places where we've done these projects, there's just been such a generosity of groups that maybe wouldn't have partnered together or some funding that, you know, might have been hard to get. And we're talking little amounts of funding, but some of these tactical urbanism projects, it's $500, $1,000 that can have a real impact. So I think there's just been, um, it's been interesting to see some of the partnerships that have taken place in this time that I don't think uh, might have been a little bit more difficult to, to see come to fruition any other time. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a beautiful segue. Um, Anna, you used the word civic and I, my curiosity is around civic. So I'm going to ask you this question. Um, last in the future Hudson as part of the Future Hudson series last year, James Howard Kunstler came and gave a talk and the title was, The American Small Town is Where It's At, Let's Get It Right, was the name of the talk. But I asked him before, I'm like, what do you mean when you, what's the word civic mean? Kai, I'm gonna use a definition. And he, he gave a long definition, but what I walked away feeling him having said was that uh, it's the relationships between all the buildings. Um, and uh, I'm sort of an, a frustrated English major, so I have a romantic view on that, that that's also the buildings, but it's also the people, right? That there's somehow the way the buildings, the relationship between the buildings shapes how we react, how we develop relationships with each other. Um, and um, again, just as a, just I'm curious how you feel about that. Anna, I feel like you just touched on it a little bit, but Kaya or Liz, I'd love to hear you talk about that. The, the impact that space and place really has on how we are as a community. Yeah, I think well, to me, has, um, you know, coming from a, yeah. well, go ahead, Anna. No, no I was just, just going like, to say, coming from a, <laughs> it's all you, go, go ahead. Now, I was just gonna, going to go back to the origin of the word in, in Latin, civitas, right? And, uh, and it has to do with a condecoration of someone who had an important role in, in an urban matter. So it has to do with people. Um, and I think buildings have to do with people, right? Buildings, they don't exist on their own. So the built environment is really about people. And, and I think that's one of the interesting things about the pandemic, right? As we were mentioning, we're re-questioning some of that space, you know, and, 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 and the role of that space and how we build it. But I do have to say in a parenthesis, a little bit off the topic, that the word civic is also, you know, it comes from the French um, to be civilized, and um, which is another problem, but, you know, how civilized are we and how savage are the others? Um, I think maybe a better word, I think in my mind, that relates to cities is um, polis from the Greek and not the, the, the Latin, right? Where we are political, right? In a very broad sense, where we act upon each other and upon the space. So yeah, I think you're right. I don't think it's a, only about buildings. Please. Yeah, I, 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 coming from a historic preservation background and kind of you know, reading about the history of preservation, at least in New York City and New York State, there's always been this talk of, you know, the great civics of the 1950s and 1960s. And, um, and uh, well, you can argue whether that was in fact true or not, but I think that what they were getting at by saying that was that there was a group of people who weren't just 
professionals with degrees in planning or architecture or preservation, but you had people from advertising, you had people from the banking world, from academia. I mean, it was just a moment where everyone kind of got involved in these uh, battles to save to save their city, you know, just taking the preservation um, point in mind. And I think that we're seeing in this pandemic that it's not just the professionals who are making decisions and shaping the streets now, it's everyone. And you're again seeing kind of this collective of people who might not have, you know, expertise or a degree in how you shape the streets or how you make policy happen, but they're doing it. And a lot of it seems to be sticking and really shaping cities and transforming them in a way that um, might be here to stay, such as you know, making room for more people, people versus cars. So I, I think that just seeing more people become involved in this conversation and more people just going out there and doing things is really exciting. Beautiful. Kai, do you have thoughts on my civic question? On, on the civic question, I, I kind of like the um, the direction that Anna was going with the difference between the, the Greek and the Romans. The, the Romans were the engineers also, right? Whereas the Greek were the people that met in the Agora and talked. So the, the idea of city was uh, a lot about, you know, had a lot to do with debating the society and it was much more connected to that. Whereas, you know, we can think the Romans for a, you know a lot of uh, innovation in hard infrastructure, aqueducts and roads. Um, they were really great engineers. Ironically, civil engineers is what we would call it now. Um, so, so I think the the there seems to be a distinction. At the same time, I would say that the the world in which we operate as urban designers is also the connection between the people-centered part of cities and the, the built or the, the physical environment of cities. And so that the, the two go hand in hand. Wonderful. Uh, I have such a, I'm such a fanboy of urban design. I'm waking up late to, I should have gone to school for. Um, so I, maybe now's the time to transition to sort of shared streets, you know, and to um, tell that story um, a little bit about um, and to acknowledge um, Hudson Hall and um, as the and as the you know the real force behind shared streets, um, but I guess um, maybe I'll just sort of tell a little brief story and then we can talk about how it came to be. I mean, my the way that it came we came to work together was sort of my curiosity about how other cities were sort of responding to the pandemic and reaching out to Ukiah um, and then the whole community in Hudson really rallying around through the Hudson Development Corporation and the task force um, around the question of what to do with Warren Street with Hudson Hall sort of really um, guiding the conversation um, and um, we uh, through the the support of uh, the Columbia Economic Development Corporation and the Spark of Hudson, we were able to, um, you guys, I asked you guys, I think I may have asked you, Kaya, if you were the planner for the city of Hudson, what would you do? Um, and um, what came out of those conversations was the, was the um, shared streets proposal, which initially was called Warren Street for All. And um, equity has been at the heart of, of just about every conversation um, about this project with you, Kaya. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about sort of Warren Street for All and the role that equity plays in the, in the shared street. Yeah, um, I feel like at the time, and this does feel like a, you know, a really long time ago now, um, we, I was here sort of still feeling a little stuck in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, um, and the first few open streets is what they called here had opened for pedestrians or closed for cars depending on how you want to describe your perspective. And it was just very simple and beautiful and inspiring um, and reminded me of my childhood. I hadn't really realized that I actually grew up on a shared street um, where cars and pedestrians would just you know, be in the same space together safely because everyone sort of watched out for each other. That said, I don't think when we first started talking as a group, of you know we our goals were clear we wanted to help help businesses um 
be able to move outdoors in order to reopen safely, to welcome customers. We had a lot of data that customers would feel more safe outdoors and didn't necessarily want to be inside restaurants or inside retail stores, but we're interested in um, in supporting local businesses. And, and so the, the initial goal was how can we do that? How can we create space on Warren Street for the businesses that are on Warren Street? How can we do that also and expand to be more inclusive and include people who aren't necessarily the typical customers of Warren Street restaurants and businesses um, and just create a space where everyone can be together, you know, physically distanced, but um, in the same space. And I think those were some of the early um, kind of strong goals or directions that we had. And, and then the concept that we developed was I think a, a result of okay, how do you how do you make that happen within the space of Warren Street and potentially other spaces in Hudson, um, and uh, you know how can you implement that actually, which is a, has been a massive undertaking that luckily Hudson Hall has uh, take you know has done such a heavy lifting to make that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm curious, um, Liz or Anna, if you might share your sort of perspective on the Shared Streets um, project. Liz, well, should I, I go? I haven't been up <laughs> Yeah, go on. Go, go first. <laughs> yeah, um, I think this, you know, this whole thing started with, with you, um, Peter and Kaya talking, and then Liz and I um, came along, um, you know, with Kaya. And at that point, when um, we started discussing um, the shared street in Hudson, I think there was one important thing that we're talking about and that we mentioned um, a little bit ago, which is the importance of, of interaction, right? So I think the six, um, the design for six feet, even the name, it came um, with this in mind, right? That we were trying to think about ways that people could socialize. And I think it's worth emphasizing um, this. And, and, and I'm going to quote this um, psychologist that I heard um, in one of these, you know, 1,000 1, webinars that we have listened to during the pandemic, but I was doing a lot of Zoom calls, um, um, and I'm doing a lot of Zoom calls um, during this this time, and it sometimes it would be very tiring, and I'm like, why is it so tiring? I'm not even getting out of my house, um, and then this guy is explaining, well, you know, as animals, we need the energy of the other, right? We need the response. We need to see the the spark in their eye. We need to know that it's being, what we're saying is being approved or not approved. We need the body um, language. We need, we need that. Um, and, and otherwise it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's draining. It's, um, it, it, it's exhaustive. Um, so um, I think there's, you know, when you and Kaya started um, talking about the shared street, I think that was the discussion that we were having. And, and then, the whole thing about bringing in um, the idea that you would not only um, customize um, the program for the consumer, but also everyone, you know, was, was very important, like Kaya said. Um, Anna, that yeah. was really, I, I completely agree with you. And I think you've reminded me too of what I miss most work during the pandemic. And it was the ability to walk down the street and have that serendipity of encounters of maybe seeing some people, you know, or bumping into new people. Um, and I think it was just, it's just that street life that I think we, you choose to be in a city, whether it's Hudson or, or New York City. And I think part of it is that, that interaction or that people watching or that ability to be in that shared space. So this was just such a great example of, of how we could see how we do it in this pandemic. Yeah, and it's been um, an amazing experience, certainly for me, um, to be a part of this and to be um, 
um, yeah, to try to be of use to, to, to Hudson in a crazy time. Um, and so we're many, many weeks into shared streets being out there and the implementation. Um, again, just sort of so much respect and admiration to Tammy and Sage of Hudson Hall and their, um, the work that they do to sort of really bring it to life and the workforce development. Um, yeah, maybe Kaya, would you talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing? This picture behind us is you at work. There you are. There's Kaya. Um, uh, uh, with uh, the workforce development. Yeah, and so I think to me, this is actually one of the most inspiring parts of this entire summer has been the way it's been implemented. So that as soon as uh, Mayor Kamal Johnson signed the executive order, uh, Mark Scrivo, you know, put these young people in our background to work building the infrastructure for it, um, which has really, I think by now is complete. And, has sort of been a really beautiful, um, positive addition to Warren Street. And I think he, on a post yesterday, just you know pointed out how much more space for a pollinator this even um, introduced, which I've, I've been thinking a lot about uh, you know, in lots of places where all these restaurants are now building planters. It also just means a lot more nature on our streets. Um, but for this program, it also meant that these young people you know, had something uh, it, you know, we're, be, we're able to participate through a workforce development program. And then I really enjoyed coming up to Hudson once a week um, throughout, you know, for the last couple of weeks uh, to talk with them about public space and streets. And this is something where I feel like we're in a strange summer where um, the topic of public space um, converged in, with two um, extremes and I th think I said at some point it's sort of the two biggest moments in these teenagers lifetime that they've experienced the pandemic um, together with this uprising um, against racism that has been really impacting our summer and our public spaces um, all over the country in very extreme ways and so to you know, take two hours out of a week uh, to talk about that and put it into the perspective of an urban planner um, for these young people has been a really rewarding experience for me, I hope, uh, for the uh, young people as well. Yeah, well, it's been wonderful to, um, yeah, to see you out there with them and to see them around. I now have a whole uh, new group of friends I get to say hello to as I walk around Hudson. Uh, and it's been a real treat. Um, and it is really moving too. Um, and it reminds me of the degree to which um, Shared Streets was really born out of, I can't remember which of you mentioned it, but this sort of completely um, novel set of relationships, you know what I mean? Like that, you know, that I would be in a conversation with Hudson Hall, with Hudson Development Corporation, with you guys, that, 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 that this, this collection of um, groups and individuals would come together um, to respond was really sort of deeply moving and inspiring. Um, and um, and continues, I think, as uh, as we as we move forward. I wonder, um, what do you guys? Um, is there anything else you guys want to talk about now about shared streets? Is there something that I'm not asking about that you'd like to talk about? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering what what else to talk about with regards to shared streets. We could transition to the Q and A, um, but if there's pieces of that story that um, well, I want to say one thing, and I think Peter, you and I, we, we've noticed this um, over the last few weeks of implementation that it, this uh, sort of moment in time where um, changes to public space uh, can be made through an executive order, through, you know, just the stroke of a pen. Um, and um, because we're still in a state of emergency is unique and I think we all need to recognize that, that um, th it, this is not how democracy should happen and hopefully we can all go back to a more fully um, democratic process of, you know, making decisions together around uh, our built in, built, the built environment that we share. That, that's sort of one thing and, and then the other thing that I think you and I and Tammy and Sage at Hudson Hall also noticed is that in 
as you're doing things so fast, and, and I would say this is actually also when you're doing things much slower, communication is always a challenge. Um, and it's sort of one of the things that I feel like I've learned as a planner early on that usually the first thing someone in a meeting asks me is why wasn't I invited? Um, and it's, so it's something that uh, I never have a good answer to that, especially because the person is actually there. Otherwise he or she couldn't ask the question. But, but it's just something to be aware of in this process of urban design and also you know, as you know, Hudson without an actual city planner may or, you know, can evolve and you know, there's lots of other public space projects that will happen that it's you know, always a good question to ask who is invited or who is inviting. And to, as a way of making sure you can be as inclusive as possible and get as many different voices as possible into the room to really, you know, share the space, but also share the space of communication about projects in the future. But um, if I may chip in, I think the other side of the coin of, of what you're saying, Kaya, and I think we have discussed this and we have put it in our report, final report also, is that somehow you have this normal quote unquote, right? And, and, and the normal that we have, is, as, as we mentioned before, is not really great for some people or some places. And um, maybe in a kind of non-democratic um, way, we are being able, because it's temporary and because it's experimental, um, try different things. And I think you said something interesting, that people can vote with their feet. Right. So, and I think that when you lack the reference, um, you lack the discussion or the critical discussion. So once you're able to experiment, once you're able to live something that is different from our normal, then you can have an idea and you can have an opinion and you can act upon it. Right. So I think there's, there's that interest in this whole um, pandemic um, and, and space discussion, you know, going back to some of the questions that Peter was asking also. Yeah, that's true. And it, it's the, that's sort of, that's been a big part of the, the genre of tactical urbanism that it allows everybody to sort of get a taste of something different or new and be able to test it out and then say yes or no to it or adjust it and change it over time without cities making big investments. Times Square in New York is, the, I think, the most famous example for how that was transformed into a pedestrian space. Um, but it's, it's a planning strategy that is now very prominent because so many cities have made adjustments to uh, the way they allocate public space um, in an emergency. And whether or not that will stick is up to the people that are using it. And, We'll have to sort of move towards a, a regular democratic process to make that a more long-term decision. I think we've also just seen so many people trying out so many ideas so quickly, at least through Instagram, that community, we've seen such a sharing of ideas where people are so quick to say, oh, no, no, you know, try this type of wood or these casters for movable planters as barriers or whatever it might be, or how you build hand washing stations in streets um, uh, in certain communities. I think there's just been um, an incredible sharing and like rapid iteration of ideas, not just in specific cities, but kind of globally, especially since we've all been uh, maybe in front of our computers and screens more than, more than ever. I think there's an expanded network of ideas that are, is going around now. Yeah, and it seems like it certainly raised the profile of like the tactical urbanism, you know, methodologies too, which was already, you know, I mean, I feel like the experience in Hudson is that, and I'm curious what your thoughts are sort of regionally, that planning in Hudson and up upstate, you know, like there's an expectation that you have a very long public input process, that, that it's your responsibility to, to really have a very extended public input process in which everybody talks for a long time prior to making a plan. Um, and um, for somebody that expects that kind of process, 
Uh, and I, and Akaya, I really appreciate you calling out that shared streets happened under extraordinary circumstances, um, and that um, more input could have been would have made it stronger. Um, uh, but I'm just curious what your I was on a a, a webinar about walking, and uh, a woman from Austin who was in Austin, Texas, who was involved in the slow streets there, you know, also spoke to the criticism of experimenting and tactical urbanism. Um, uh, for its lack of input, but push back against it for the reasons that you guys are talking about. Um, and I wonder, is there any other way, is there a way to um, alleviate the tension that comes from um, the kind of the experiment, the experimenting? Is that a clear question? No. I don't know if, we, if there is a need to alleviate uh, unless, I, I think what's more important is that you can see it as one of many ways of collecting input and having an engagement process or a discussion around collective space. And it, it's, not, um, it, it's not the only solution, and I think we always need to be aware of that. And, and it's also, you know, it's kind of strange of, of cities to themselves then use grassroots uh, tactics to change their public space, which is a way cities do that to circumvent, you know, long budgeting processes where you, you know, you have long elected a new mayor before you even get to the capital budget to implement the plan. And so that, that stifles a lot of movement sometimes. So, but it's just one of many ways. And I think the, great variety of input and conversation, including things like your future Hudson series, but also including sort of uh, typical, you know, come and give us feedback, uh, events like what just happened for Promenade Hill Park. Um, all of those together make up the menu or repertoire that we have in, in talking to the users of public space. And I think that that's kind of the most important to just not weigh one over the other, but utilize them as, as much as possible, all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think maybe my, I was curious that to what degree has the way that planning operates changed in 30 years? Like the, it feels like the practices that you guys bring to bear is distinct than what has traditionally been practiced around here. Is that, is that fair or unfair? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I think we, we would like to think so, although um, I believe that the world in which you can practice uh, planning, urban planning differently, or that the scale at which you can practice it differently is still very small. And, you know, a lot of sort of larger infrastructure projects go through a regulatory process that is well defined and has been for the last 30 years or so. Environmental review processes and kind of require public hearings and things like that. Yeah. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask a question that's in the Q and A and then I would thought I would ask Aaron to uh, join us to do some Q and A. The first one I see is sort of what's the plan for winter? How do you, we let thinking about shared streets, thinking about Hudson, thinking about cities everywhere. How do we, how do we think about public space as we approach a change of season? Who would like to go first? Anna or Kaya, you want to go? I don't know if we have a plan. I mean, we, it's, I haven't heard much talk about winter except for the worry about it. You know, what's going to happen once it gets cold and everyone's worried about a second wave and, and the flu season. And I think Liz mentioned this early on that through this, the, the collection of images, um, we've been able to sort of watch an evolution of concerns and, and responses in a way. And I feel like we're right now in this phase of where the concerns and responses are, are very strongly focused on how do we open schools safe? What if that could be moved outdoors? If any, you know, whether it's uh, school lunches moving outdoors, 
uh, that the same thing is true for university campuses. So one of our winning teams in Newburgh is actually a group of students from Vassar who are actively working on figuring out how to make their campus safe. And um, yes, I, I believe, you know, once October hits, we, we will all start thinking about, oh my God, it's going to get cold. And what do we do then? And do we need more? Are we going to continue to stay outdoors and we're all going to put up these heat lamps and tents? Uh, or will we be safe enough indoors now? I don't know yet. I, I don't know yeah, if, and I don't know if any of us know. <laughs> No, I don't think any of us know, and that's the thing. So kind of thinking about how you can kind of create as many options as possible, especially when we don't know where the pandemic will be, if there will be a second wave. So I think the thing is to see what other places are doing, but then just make sure that you have flexibility and maybe several options to how you could operate outdoors or indoors and, and really kind of just see how the fall goes in terms of dealing with the pandemic itself. Well, yeah, I want to. Oh, Anna. Sorry, I, I I'm not going to give an answer to the question, but I think um, it it um, reminds me of another important topic. Um, I think that the pandemic brought us um, in relation to cities and 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 its open spaces, which is, I think, in an urban environment, especially in big cities, right? Like um, you forget about the environment, right? You forget about outdoors. Even if you're strolling through the, you know, on the sidewalk and you're, you know, crossing the street, using public public transportation, but I think it, it's also going to force us, especially when we don't have the good weather anymore, um, to think about, you know, our green spaces and our, um, you know, islands of heat and islands of cold. Um, you know what we're doing in terms of of of, of our own environment when we're not protected um, within walls, um, and I, I'm not giving an answer, but I think it's 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 an important and kind of interesting um, reflection that I think it's also going to bring. Yeah. Um, I think to Aaron, that do we have point, any? Yeah, we're going to actually open up and. Um, what we talked about earlier, we'll have all of the attendees go live with us so we can turn it into a uh, physically distanced but dialogue between everyone and we can actually have a conversation with our attendees. Great. Yeah, so uh, what we'll ask is each person um, just keep their mute and but you can come in with video and then raise your hand as all of these other Zoom meetings have gone. All right. Everyone should be entering right about now. Thank you. I'd like to thank our panelists for such an incredible uh, presentation and acknowledge the questions that have come into the Q&A so far. Um, Aaron really runs the show, along with Elena Wilson, program manager. Um, but thank you for such a high level of dialogue and such great attendance today as we all shift gears in the Zoom webinar. Also, I hope those that have put questions into the box, um, I believe Tambor Dillon, Katie Flamia, and now our colleague Rebecca Wolf, who will have her own series in a week. Um, we, we hear you and over to Elena and Aaron for this portion of the session. Yeah, so uh, Rebecca, if you'd like to ask your question live or I can ask it for you, um, I just wanted to make sure that you had your own voice for your question. Oops, unmute. Uh, sure, thanks. I was just gonna let it be part of the Q&A, but um, let's see, now I, it, it's not visible to me how I asked it. <laughs> Um, but what I said uh, loosely was something like, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the equity piece of the project. Um, oops. Okay. There's my phone. Um, uh, and the follow-up background that I 
added to that was something like um, Hudson has experienced so much cultural displacement for the black and brown community and tourism is to some extent the face of that and um, so to create you know to carve out the space for um, essentially tourism facing businesses um, has right. seemed me I mean this is my observation um, like like a very significant um, extension of that well I would like to I would like to thank Rebecca for being a future hot topics panel organizer and for the work that she does locally and to some in the literary community nationally and internationally um, I'd like to build a bridge here as a brown man that grew up in New York State and say, I'm always interested in the Arabic speaking delis, which I go and support and <laughs> support as much as I can these days. But I think the dialectic Rebecca contributes to the table, and I'm very appreciative of it, is where, where are we headed? Are we headed to Provincetown? Are we headed to Fire Island? Are we headed to, you know, where is this headed in terms of tourism and how does it impact public health? So I really appreciate the question and I hope to make a bridge back to future Hudson um, to, to reply. Yeah, if I could just extend that question. I mean, what I was, because I noticed that Peter did ask the panelists to talk on that and that there wasn't a lot of discussion of it and but it has been you know something foremost in my mind as yeah. I've observed the project yeah I, I appreciate the question um, and uh, nice to see you Rebecca uh, yeah I mean I, Kaya, I mean, I'm curious what you how you would respond I mean my my sense is or I would respond by saying that shared streets was uh, uh, had an equity focus by um, creating opening shared street spaces, public space available for everybody. And I feel like there are voices that say that what we've done is focus too much on businesses. And I've heard people say that we've not focused enough on businesses. That, um, and uh, there's some weird, there's some, um, uh, um, I'm not gonna be able to articulate that well right now. So the focus of the project, the program was to provide equal access to the street. Um, there were further visions about um, creating opportunities for non Warren Street businesses to be available to have access to the street and to see um, that there's a, an intersection of what I would call care, like the way that we care for each other and create space for each other um, can also become sort of a competitive advantage. I feel like there's people who are worried about equity that see this as tourism focused. Uh, and they don't see that there's a real um, intent at opening up public space for everybody. And there are people who are community minded who see it as being only exclusively focused on commerce. Um, you know, the, the, the objective of shared streets was to help businesses reopen. But reopening businesses means reopening for residents, means reopening for um, everybody. Uh, and so um, the, its intent was always to create, create, treat street space as public space and to give everybody as much access as possible. Um, and I think if that, I hope that made sense. Kaya, how would you respond to or put sort of equity in the context of shared streets? Well, I, I would say that part of this is also, it, it comes back to um, something that we discussed earlier and it has to do with capacity. And so I, I do think that we had, greater ambitions when we initially discussed the plan. So we were hoping that by the end of July, this is all rolling smoothly and we can really focus on expanding it to other streets that aren't maybe necessarily business focused, but would have other benefits. What if, you know, the space, the, what if you close the block in front of the library and allow the library to expand for, you know, an expansion of curbside pickup that can also include sort of light programming, the kind of, you know, physically distant programming that we had hoped uh, if the weather would have allowed us to have in front of Hudson Hall today. Um, we had talked about, we talked to the youth department early on in the process of how we could accommodate them. We've talked to friends of Oakdale and sort of helped a little bit with uh, arranging the infrastructure there to open Oakdale. Um, but 
a lot of these sort of, we also had great ambitions to sort of include more public infrastructure in the public spaces, the pocket parks or along Warren Street or the 7th Street Park to allow people to just be there, gather in public space, um, distance without, you know, that being tied to um, patronizing a business. Um, so, so a lot of this, I think we are all at the point now where we're realizing that our own capacity is, is limited in implementing some of these aspects. And I think that's a lesson learned and hopefully to carry into the future that um, maybe the starting point needs to be at a different place in order to ensure that equity piece first. And um, so it's a good thing to further discuss of how to enhance that. Yeah, I, I just, I'm uh, hoping that, you know, yeah, I, I would imagine that this, well, who knows where we'll be next summer, but um, if this should be another, you know, happening in the future, it seems like it will be important to, you know, really have that piece in place as you, as you uh, mm -hmm. roll forward. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks. Agree. Are there any other questions from our attendees today? Aaron, Aaron, I think, do you want to map on, I know Tammy asked a question as well as Katie, and Aaron, you, you seem to have mapped um, public sculpture as a kind of foil for this edition, right? With all the venue safety is sort of how can you have a walkable or a window art type of edition during the pandemic that Tammy mentioned. So how does an, what does an equitable map, map your edition onto Rebecca's equity question and the public sculpture or the, the diversity therein? I think it's a real puzzle. That's sort of my experience so far and we're all in it together. Yeah, sure. The, the concepts behind uh, the public art initiative or the pop-up uh, art initiative was to really have a broad, wide swath of art that is available to everyone. Um, much of my practice as a whole is rooted in the democratization of the art community and the arts community as a whole. And how we're able to present to audiences regardless of where they live, regardless of their upbringing, regardless of their education, and by placing works throughout the entirety of Hudson, um, people are able to stumble upon them as they're walking, you know, walking their dog in the morning, taking a walk to their job, um, you know just going around town and the way i see it is as people are living their daily lives they're able to encounter these works and understand that these artists are not so dissimilar from them that many times these artists are speaking on their behalf and creating works that are a discussion about the lives that they're living in these neighborhoods and things so um Truly, it was a way of navigating a physically distanced world while still being able to engage within communities and present outside the box thinking of what it means to have uh, a gallery or a museum or a festival or, or art on display. anyone else have any uh we're about at 205 um if there's any other questions we have about five more minutes uh, if not we can also wrap up this first edition well i i'd like to thank the panelists and also as we as we navigate this kind of format and this is the first of actually nine days of 1 p.m series this is funded by humanities new york um, I wanted to clarify that this is taking place live for the production team at Hudson Hall and for those keynote speakers who may wish to attend in the West Room. But just to maybe 
since we're all rowing in the same direction, just to tie this together, um, I believe that Hudson Hall and um, future Hudson deserve credit for the for the enormous leadership they've provided. But Hudson Hall also helping the businesses to expand outdoors from a community and economic development perspective, often staffing it. Um, but Katie asked a question for winter. So I just wanted to be helpful. Um, and I, I, I think that that's sooner than we may think. And I, I also want, I think where Rebecca points us is tourism and does tourism spike the numbers and for whom? So could we, you know, true to mission, could we thank, but also engage the panelists to maybe, I don't know, do you want us, instead of, it would be so satisfying if we could be all in person, but let's make that bridge with the three questions we have. And if you look at your Q and A tab, I think we, I think we addressed the, went the, I think we addressed the season question. Do, does anybody have anything else to add about the about looking forward to winter? Um, that was my question. So I, I was just curious, maybe, um, you know, with your Instagram feed, you're getting so many interesting things that were evolving. Maybe there's even just a, call for thoughts about that so that you would put it in people's minds that you're interested in seeing what people have to say about that because it is i mean even even without the pandemic like what is urban space in the winter for people to gather and where can they gather um and where are you allowed to go um without necessarily spending a lot of money if you're if you don't have a lot of money to spend like how do you use the city differently and i think that's a perennial question it's not just for covid but i think it has particular implications now um katie I think that's a great idea to do a call for proposals for Instagram because one of the things about our Instagram account is um, unless prodded people aren't often aren't sharing their concept designs or what some of their challenges are so we're we're seeing things that are being implemented and not kind of the lead up to that of the thought process so maybe figuring out a way of sending an invitation to get people to share the questions concerns and conceptual ideas that are happening so that that can be part of the larger concept not just the moment of implementation that happens um, you know once winter is here so thank you for that and if i can just add on this question of you know where in public space can people spend time if they don't want to spend a lot of money so this this was an interesting question that came up uh during our classes with the um shared street ambassadors um all of them being young people who sort of, you know, the places that come up are um, mostly public spaces. And yes, that gets more difficult in, uh, in the winter time. And one thing, and this is not just in Hudson, but I've heard that before from many teenagers, it's uh, the Taco Bells, the McDonald's. Um, because strangely enough, in, in urban planning jargon, it's often called the third space. Um, it's sort of this, not re this not really public space, but that can be used by the public. And I think, you know, whether it's indoor or outdoors for safety reasons, I do think that uh, young people um, who often cannot spend a lot of money, who are often perceived by others as a nuisance, are a great lens to sort of think through this. Like, what are the spaces where you can just be and gather with your friends without being asked for why you're there or how much money you can spend there. Um, and so I, this is just a call for engaging um, young people in the conversation of how to create these spaces um, as much as we can because it's also you know, engaging them in the future of their own built environment. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Katie. Okay, everyone, well, we're about at 2.10, right on time. So um, I just wanna thank everyone uh, for attending today and let you know that we have 
uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m. and every day leading up until Labor Day at 1 p.m. here at Hudson Hall and on Zoom, uh, we'll be broadcasting live. So we'll be covering uh, Curating Hudson with Mahogany Brown tomorrow. So thank you, Peter. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Kaya. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, everyone that attended. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.